A level is a control used by Revit to set the elevations or height of each building component inside of the project. Now, as we can see, we're currently inside of the south elevation view. And what's already here in the project is level one and level two. And we're gonna to need to add a top of footing level as well as several levels up above. In order to be able to do this, there's really two different methods that we can use. The first method is to come up here on the ribbon underneath the structure tab and look for level, and it should be over toward the right-hand side. Go ahead and select on level, and if you move your mouse down, you'll see that you can move the mouse up above your existing levels or down below your existing levels. In this case, we're gonna draw the top of footing level, and since it's the footings, it's gonna be down below, and each of our levels are just gonna go at 15 foot increments. So I'm gonna move this down until I see the number 15, and you can see there's a dash line there. That dash line comes into play if I move over to the right or to the left. And if I'm lined up directly at the end point of this particular level, we'll see that 15 foot mark and the dash line. So go ahead and click there, move over until you see the next dash line over there on the right hand side and go ahead and click. Now, if we zoom in and you can do that by using the wheel on your mouse, you can see there's now a level three at negative 15 feet. Also level two right now is at 10 foot, and we're gonna to wanna to have that be at 15 foot. So in order to be able to adjust this one's elevation up to 15 foot, we'll start off by just hitting escape a couple times on the keyboard in order to make sure that we're out of the command. Next, we're gonna select on that 10 foot dimension, and if we click on it a second time, you'll start to see it highlight, and you can just type in 15 foot at this time. Now we're gonna to need to do a couple more things. Now we could just keep drawing our levels in, but what I'd like to do now is the second way of going about drawing our levels, and that is to use the copy command to do it. So I'm gonna select on a level, and once you do that, you'll notice that the copy command is available up here on the ribbon. Go ahead and select on copy, pick a point. In this case, I'm gonna pick a point on level one, and what this is gonna allow us to do is be able to make multiple copies at 15 foot increments. One thing to know first, if you don't already have multiple checked here, make sure that multiple is checked or else it's only going to allow you to make one copy and you'll have to re-execute the command again. So go ahead and select a point here on level one, move up like this, select a point on level two. We now have our third level. I know it says level four, but we'll eventually we'll rename this our third floor. So we'll make this fourth floor, fifth, sixth, and keep executing this command. We'll move this up to seven, eight, nine, and this last one's gonna be a roof level, so this is gonna be our 10th level, or our 10th floor, our roof floor, all right? If we've done it right, if you zoom in, you should notice that this last one's at 135 feet. And you can go ahead and hit escape a couple of times to get out of the command. Now, the next step that we need to do is actually rename each of these levels so that they, one, display right, and two, they'll show up in the right order over here on our project browser. So far, all the ones that show up here on the project browser are levels one, two, and three. And we can tell that even without looking here at the project browser, because currently they all have labels that show up as being the color of blue. Now we'll talk about how to make plans over here underneath the project browser associated with each of these other levels. But first let's go ahead and rename this bottom one first. And this is going to be zero dash T O footing, so top of footing. It'll ask, would you like to rename the corresponding views? And what that means is, would you like to rename the views that show up underneath the project browser here over on the left-hand side? And the answer to that question is going to be yes. And we can now see that we have zero dash top of footing level plan view over here in the project browser. Go ahead and do this with level one, where we'll have one dash first floor Rename corresponding views. We'll just keep saying yes to that for now. Two dash second floor. Yes. This next one's gonna be the third floor. So of course that's gonna be the number three dash third floor. Now technically this can be any sort of naming scheme that you wanna do. So if you just wanted to say third or structural floor or whatever you wanna call it, you can. This next one's gonna be the fourth floor. Now the reason why we're putting the number first is that when it comes time to make these views, it'll try to do it numerically over here underneath the project browser. If we don't put that number in, then it'll try to do it alphabetically instead. 
And then you're going to have floors sort of out of sequence with one another, and it'll be a little bit harder to find over here. So I always like to put the numbers in first, just so it looks right over in the project browser, and it makes things a lot easier to find. This will be the fifth floor. And we'll continue to do this on up until we get to the ninth floor. And this final one is going to be 10-roof. Technically, we could call it R-roof if we wanted to, but realistically, this is just going to be 10-roof or 10-roof plan. You can name it the way that you want to. Now that we have these, we have all of our levels in place, but we still don't have all of our floor plans showing up over here underneath the project browser. So the next thing we'll need to do is come up here underneath the View tab on the ribbon, and we're going to need to look for this word here that says Plan Views. And we're going to select Structural Plans. So it's going to put these roofs under the Structural Plans in the Project Browser. Next, we can just highlight each of these. And you can do that by just selecting on one, holding down the Shift key, and then clicking the last one, and click on OK. Now, we may have seen a flash on the screen. If your computer's a little bit slower than mine, you may have seen these views automatically regenerate on the screen. And what happened is, is it automatically created all these different views over here on the Project Browser. And what we're looking at is, in this case, it happens to be the roof plan view. And if we close each one of these individually, we'll eventually get back to our first floor view. Or actually, in this case, we end up closing out that last view. So it ended up actually taking us back to our elevation view, in this case, our south elevation view. And now that we have all these over here in the Project Browser, it means that we can start to draw any of our entities from Revit inside of the appropriate view. So, using levels, we can specify such things as floor-to-floor -floor heights and the locations of objects. And these floor plan views will be the basis for everything else that we draw. A structural grid is used as a layout and dimensioning tool for those creating the structural layout of a building. To create this grid in Revit, we need to be in a floor plan view. So in this case, we'll go to our 1-first floor view. And underneath the Structure tab again on the ribbon, we're going to come over here to Grid. So go ahead and select on Grid. We need to draw in where our first structural grid is going to be located at. And this is going to be our first one. Move our mouse down to somewhere in this general area here on the screen and click once. And then just move straight up. Somewhere in this area, go ahead and click. Now, the exact length of these doesn't really matter so much. We can always make adjustments to them later. And I'll zoom in here just so that you can see that this is the first one that we've done. Now, it is labeled number one. And because that one is labeled number one, it means if we stay in this command and then move our mouse down here to the bottom of the screen. Now, if we move over until this says 25 feet, and for right now, we'll just eyeball it and just get it till it says 25 feet, and then click. We can then move straight up and click, and we can see that that one's number two. And all the rest of them are going to continue this sequence. So we'll have a 3, a 4, a 5, and a 6. So we can zoom out, move back down to the bottom again. And now this time, instead of just sort of eyeballing it and getting that 25 feet like what we did last time, you can type in 25 for 25 feet, and then just hit Enter on the keyboard. And now that'll automatically place that at a 25-foot spacing away from the last one that you did. Come straight up until it's lined up, and repeat that process one more time. So 25 feet, enter, come straight up, and click. 25 feet, come straight up, and click. Now this next one is going to be number six. This one's going to be a little bit different from the rest. It's going to be for two columns that we're going to have in a future exercise. They're going to be located right around here. So this one isn't going to be at a 25-foot spacing. This one's just going to be at 8 foot 6 inches. So in order to be able to accomplish that, all you have to do is come down to the bottom, just like you did before, and type in 8, the foot sign, and then the number 6. It'll automatically assume that that's 6 inches because it's after a foot sign. Hit Enter. Move straight up until that's lined up with the rest of them as well. Now we can see that we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now the next one we need to do is going to be the letter A, and that's going to go from right to left. Now to do this, you can just click once, move over, but Revit likes to keep these in sequence. So you can see that this last one that we just did is number seven now. Now in order to be able to adjust that, it's fairly simple to do. All you have to do is hit escape on your keyboard a couple of times, select back on that grid, click on the number seven, and now change that to be an A. If you've done levels, then you'll know that you can do the same thing with your levels. Select on a level line, click on the name of the level, and then type in. It's the exact same process. Now, with the letter A here, we could continue the draw the way that we have been doing, 
But I'll point out that you can also use another command, the copy command, in order to be able to do this. So go ahead and select on the level, click on copy, move straight down, and when you see those temporary dimensions showing up there on the side, in this case it says 13 feet, go ahead and just type in 25. And it'll continue this 25 foot spacing. And you can see since the last one we did was A, this next one we're going to do is going to be B. Move straight down again, 25 feet. Do this one more time. You want to have a grid line D, so 25 feet. Now, if for some reason the command stopped when you just did the first one, remember it's probably because you had this multiple and it wasn't checkmarked. As long as you had multiple checkmarked, you should have been able to do multiple copies at the same time. Now, you can go ahead and hit escape a couple of times to get totally out of the command. Now, it's important to remember that structural grids in Revit are really easy to create, and their job is to provide the framework for all the structural layout of our building. Temporary dimensions are used for reference and layout of objects inside of Revit. Now, inside of this first floor view, we're going to go ahead and select on one of these column grids. So go ahead and select on perhaps this one. It has the number 4 associated with it. When you do that, you can see these temporary dimensions show up. Now, what the temporary dimensions allow you to do is if you click on the number, like in this case, I'm going to click on the 25 feet, you can then type, in this case, 20 for 20 feet, and it'll automatically give you that spacing between one and the other. You'll also notice that the next one happens to be, in this case, 30 feet. If instead of being 30 feet, we wanted this to be perhaps 20 feet, we could just click on the number 30, change this to be 20, and you can now see how that's 20, and now this one is 30. So it just temporarily gives you a dimension that reports the information between the objects that it's measuring. Now, in this case, I actually like the 25 foot spacing, so I'm gonna go ahead and change this to be 25 foot, so this is 25 and 25 foot again. Now, something else to know about these temporary dimensions is that they don't necessarily have to go just to these spots that we're currently looking at, but in order to be able to adjust this, let me show you something else. There's this little option down here that looks like a dimension. If you go ahead and click on that, and then click somewhere out here into space, you'll now see that these have now become what's considered a permanent dimension. So, if I select on this, zoom out, pull it up, you can now see that we have a permanent dimension, one that didn't go away when we deselected anything, up here at the top of the screen. If for some reason we don't want to have one of these two dimensions, it's not hard to make that adjustment. All you have to do is move your arrow over, hit tab, and you can see how I hit the tab key. I'm just clicking on it right now to select one. You can then hit delete on your keyboard, and it will delete that dimension. If you hit escape, that dimension is still there. Now, if I select on this dimension again, I can always click on these dots that show up here. In this case, I'm going to click on this top dot and just kind of hold my mouse button down and drag it over here to the end. And you can see it's starting to give me an updated dimension based on where I'm clicking and dragging this over and touching another object. So let me click here, drag it over. You can see that there's a dimension there. And I could do the same thing here because this is going to be really my main bay between number one and number five. And I can just click and drag that over. And now I can see that my overall dimension of my bay is 100 feet in this direction. And if I wanted to, I could do the same thing going down the sides. So at their heart, temporary dimensions are really just quick reference and modification tools that are provided in Revit structure. They allow you to be able to make quick modifications and get immediate feedback on distances between objects. Sometimes we need to keep items from moving when we model and draw them. To do this in Revit takes a command known as pin. In this example, we'll use pin to keep the structural grid in its proper location so we don't accidentally move them as we design our structure. So to use pin, all we have to do is decide, all right, what is it that we want to be able to pin in place so they don't move? In this case, we don't want any of our structural grids to be able to move as we're drawing everything else around them. So simply move your mouse up here, sort of above where the A and the 6 is at, and click and hold down. Move over in this direction, and then when you have all your structural grids highlighted in blue like this, go ahead and let go. Now you should see all of your structural grids highlighted like this. Now the next thing we're going to do is use the pin tool. And the pin actually looks like a little push pin that you can push down. And go ahead and select on the pin. And when you do it, you'll get all these little pin head symbols that show up. What it means is that each of these objects that have been highlighted are now pinned in place. What this means is if you select on one, and then try to move it from spot to spot or use the move command, it won't allow you to do it because they're pinned and there's no way to be able to move their locations. 
This way you don't have your structural grid moving six inches in one direction. And then when it comes time to build it out in the field, they end up building something that just isn't structurally feasible and might end up falling down. So think of it as sort of your safety valve to be able to pin stuff in place and not have to worry about it moving. So in this exercise, we learned that the ping command holds items in their spot, so they can't be accidentally moved.